Hello and welcome to Flipping Through the Internet's number one Mad Magazine news review and interview channel. And today we're live, live with a guest the first time in, in how long? Well, I guess not that long. It was like two weeks ago we had Kyle Bridget. But it's a new guest. It's a new face, a new creator, a new historian. Yes, indeed. If you have not already, hey, say what's up in the chat. Uh, I'm going to be going to the chat and saying hello to everybody um, very soon here. And if you're tuned in, please make sure to hit the thumbs up button. That's a great way to support this live stream that you're currently watching. Hit subscribe. It's the best way to support this channel and um, leave comments. If you want to support me in another way, why you would want to, I do not know. Uh, go to patreon.com slash flipping through. Um, you can give me your money, um, believe it or not, but it's a trade. We can trade. Look at you. You give me money and then I give you some beautiful stickers. Potter ZB, Potter ZB system of weights and measures, flipping through channel logo. This Max Corn was here. It's clear. You can go slap that. You can put that on a toilet. You can put it on somebody's car, um, make it look like they've been vandalized. You can do all of that and more. Um, Hey, these are the people, though, that are supporting me right now. David Strickler, Megan McInerney, Shane Buckley, Bobby Weigel, Cam Hayden, Ed Meisinger, Rob Wilson, Rod Mead, Sperry, Andrew Goldfarb, Casey Ori, and Kyle Bridget. Thank you so much for the support, guys. I hope I can keep on earning it. Let's look at the chat real quick. Who's here? The Sketchy Works is here. What's up, man? Happy late Thanksgiving, everybody. I hope everybody had fun yesterday. I did not. I did not. There's a cold sweeping through my household, um, and I might be next. I might be the next victim of this cold. Um, Shane Buckley, hello. Uh, good evening to you, sir. Um, oh, I got to email you. I uh, I want to email you and talk about something. Um, Harvey Esquire, how do you do? Ho ho holiday. Um, yeah. Now it's we're officially at Christmas now. That's how it works. The Friday. After Thanksgiving is Christmas time. Um, who else is here? Clown Nookie is here. Hey, fellers. Enjoying leftovers as we chat. <laughs> nom, nom, nom. Yeah, I had some leftovers. That's what I had. Um, oh, Demir is here. A historian, you say? Yeah, I do say that. That is what I said. Uh, <laughs> lunar comments are banned, Harvey. Harvey, like you got to watch it, all right? Um I don't know what else to say. I can't help you. That's the mod. That's saved the best for last. Yes, little cozy nostril. Kyle Bridget is here. Thank you so much for showing up. Um, mod still is here. Mod still. What does that mean? I don't know. That seems like a, is that a portmanteau? Um, it's top secret, Shane. I can't tell you anymore. Anyway, that's about it. Um, the person that I am introducing you to you today is a gentleman by the name of Mark Arnold. Mark Arnold is a uh, podcaster, a YouTuber, uh, a, a writer, creator. A writer is like he, he writes books. He writes books on Cracked. He's working on one for Mad Magazine. Um, what else? Harvey Comics. I have his website right here, in fact, but we'll get into all of that. Uh, here he is. Please give him a warm round of applause. Mark Arnold. Yeah, it's me. Hi. <laughs> How are you, Mark? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing very, very well. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for coming on. Um, we were talking before about how I was lamenting that I've fallen asleep at the helm of this YouTube channel, and I haven't had anybody on. And uh, we got in contact with each other, and like it was like manna from heaven. Is, you appeared in my <laughs> life. <laughs> No, I've seen the show before, so it's not like I just was wandering through on the YouTube and I go, "Wow, that's flipping through." Ooh. No, um, you've had guests, uh, friends I know. You've had Mort Todd, you've had Andrew Goldfarb, uh, other people. So I said, "Why not me?" Yeah, why not you? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you have a podcast. I'm dropping the link in the chat right now for the people uh, who are watching. Um, the Fun Ideas Fun podcast. Fun Ideas podcast, yes. And yeah, tell us a little bit about that. 
Okay, it covers all the subjects I'm kind of interested in, so it goes all over the map, not just Mad Magazine. So it's uh, comic books, animation, movies, TV, and music. So you could tune in one week and have a music guest, tune in another week and it'd be someone in the world of animation, tune in another week and be a comic book collector. You know, it, I, and I don't discriminate and say, oh, you're not big enough for me. So I have fans as well as uh, actual celebrities. I've had a few mad people on the show like, Tom Richmond. I've had uh, let's see, Peter Bag on the show. Um, oh, nice. To think about it now. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I'm trying to get Charles Cadu on the show, but uh, he's yeah. kind of like hesitant right now. But he'll be on the show. I'll get him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, I got had Bill Morrison on the show, and I, you know, I actually got him to discuss the short-lived tenure at Mad. Yeah. Uh, at first, he didn't want to, and they said, "Oh, you have to reveal it." I, I gave him his space. Uh, yeah. You know, it was like two years after he got dismissed, and then I said, "All right, let's talk about it a little bit." You know, and I, I you know, and you know, I, I treated it delicately, and yeah. you know, it's like it's unfortunate because I thought Morrison was doing a good job before they went to reprints, but you know, I guess money is where it's at. You know, so. Yeah, That's where we are, but, but you know, I at least got him to talk about it. Of course, he talks about the Simpsons and everything else on that episode. But yeah, you know, well, so. that's um, I, 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 he, he's a friend of the show. That's yeah. uh, he, he was a previous guest on uh, this channel, and I'm curious. Um, I would love. I'm, uh, I'm gonna have to find that episode of Fun Ideas because I would be very interested to watch it. You know, he he talked exclusively about Mad Magazine there. Um, or his time at Mad Magazine, but yes. you know, I I had asked, you know, is there anything you don't want to talk about? And he was like, you know, if people ask about how I left, yeah, I have a canned response, but I'd rather not talk about it. And yeah. you know, so I didn't bring it up or anything. Did he talk about it? That aspect of it with you? A little bit more in detail, yeah. Okay. I mean, we we discussed it briefly ahead of time, and I told him since I don't go live like you do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, we pre-recorded it. All, also, my first hundred episodes are audio only for the most part, and so okay. he's an audio only one. But you can still see it; you can hear it on YouTube. It just has yeah. the logo the whole time. Uh, but uh, yeah, he went through his whole career. He's talking about The Simpsons. He's talking about uh, Rockwell, his uh, own strip, and everything like that, uh, and working at Disney and everything else. And you know, he knew it was coming. You know, but like I said, you know, I kept it very diplomatic. I'm never one to like, you know, so what was it like? Didn't you feel awful? You know, and I know some people are that way when they interview, but yeah, he's a friend of mine. So I didn't want to go too much, but I said, you got to let me know. And I, you know, I did tell him, I gave him space. You know, it wasn't like the next day after it happened. It's like, how do you feel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so at least yeah. he could process it and see what happened afterwards and things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh it was cool talking to him because I didn't realize like I knew like a lot of my guests, I, I only know their time at Mad Magazine, a lot of these people. So it's it's fun because I can I can learn a lot more. And I knew there was a, a connection to The Simpsons. I didn't know how much of an influence he had with Futurama, yeah. which was I mean, when I was in uh elementary and high school, oh no, I, I think I was just it was in high school that I saw that show, it was like a game changer for me. That was like, I loved that show so much. So it was, um, that was a pretty neat thing to, to learn as we were talking, but, um, let's, I want to change the subject a little bit to, uh, to cracked your other, uh, another friend of yours and friend of the show, uh, Mort Todd. Look, <laughs> Nice. You want a copy of that? Go to redbubble.com. My friend Chet Reams makes these. So anyway. Nice. Yeah. Well, I got one of these um, from Mort after he was on the show. I emailed him about it. Um, or no, I think it was before it um, because somebody said he, he had some made up. But my yeah. head is so massive. Oh. <laughs> I have to like, I'm going to have to like buy an extender for this if I ever want to wear it. Okay. But, that was one of the Kickstarter. We did a Kickstarter, and that's one of the the um, what is the word? Uh, not giveaway gimmicks or whatever. Or, you know, yeah. We had some postcards and stickers and 
I don't remember. Oh, some larger, not, like magazine sized posters. And that was for these two books that we did a Kickstarter a couple Here, years ago. Here, let me. Ago. Um... So. Boom. There we go. Solo layout. Now we can okay. see you. The fully. comedy of John Severin and the comedy of Jack Davis. And it uh, is reprints from Crack Magazine. Uh, we do have an introduction. We got the best quality reproductions we could get. I mean, I'll show you, like, like for example, the, this inner cover is yeah. a, a Davis original. This is from Heritage Auction. So that's the actual original artwork without the Crack logo at the top. So we wanted it to look good. Uh, the rest of it, you know, we had to scan from the original issues because if you read my two books, which I'll hold those up now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these, <laughs> if you're cracked, you're happy, volume one and two. Um, the story is that uh, after 9-11, unfortunately, where Cracked was, which was also where National Enquirer and The Globe and those kind of tabloid magazines were, and they were a victim of uh anthrax where the anthrax was sent in the mail and you probably oh, yeah. heard about it in the news at that time if you're around and uh so unfortunately cracked was housed there all their films of all the old issues had to be destroyed because you know there's risk of anthrax you know oh, residue yeah. on everything and so uh if one was to reprint cracked at this point, they have to scan their issues, the printed issues, or go back to the original artwork. Unfortunately, the original artwork's all over the world. Collectors have it. I even have pieces and stuff like that. So yeah, it's easier to get from the magazines itself. And that's what we did. Is I scanned the, the pages because I have all the issues, and then Mort Todd cleaned it up and made it look really good. And it actually looks really impressive in those books. So. Yeah, I have the Jack Davis one. Mm -hmm. um, Mort Todd sent me a copy of that. And it's, it's awesome. So... You worked with Mort Todd to like, you, were you the curator of what to compile? Well, Cause... this one actually, you mentioned the Jack Davis one, is um, yeah. there was a cracked collector's edition that came out that Mort Todd put out back in the 90s that mm -hmm. was a salute to Jack Davis. And it um, has the same contents, um, but this is a little bit better because I scanned it from the original issues. He was scanning it from... Uh, varying sources and so some of them were actually incorrect on the piece and so we got it oh, okay. so this is the corrected version um and it has a uh an article by bob stewart the late bob stewart and then afterward by mort todd that we've added to it and just a few other doodads and promotions and stuff like that so yeah. and you know mort did this layout and he actually did the layout on my crack books too so he's a good graphic designer. He designed my Fun Ideas podcast logo. He also yeah. designed my 50 Webs website. So, you know. Oh, I'm uh, so glad that you mentioned that. <laughs> Boom. Now it's in. Yeah, your web. And this is like, I was on your Facebook page and we were talking. There's like, this has all links to all of the other relevant websites yeah. that you have. Also, um, all the books that you've you've worked on over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, we have a, an audience question. This is Noah Van Skyver, friend of the show, Noah Van Skyver. Hey, Mark, has Mort Todd ever talked about his early days as Daniel Klaus's roommate to you? Yes. Um, in the crack book I have, um, I actually interviewed Dan for the book, and I probably got his contact information from Mort. I interviewed him over the phone way back when. I, my crack books came out 10 years ago, actually. Um, but then I met Dan Close later at a show, and we had the discussion as well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, I got a few different stories. I mean, the most uh, infamous one is the back cover quote. Um, although I think uh, the back cover quote is censored on my back cover. <laughs> the uncensored <laughs> version's in the text. But basically, Dan Close says, no one was ever a fan of track. We would buy Mad every month, but about two weeks later, we would get anxious for new material. We had to tell ourselves, oh, okay, we're not going to buy crack, never again. And we'd hold out for a while. But then as the month dragged on, it just became, okay, I guess I'll buy crack. Then you'd bring it home and immediately remember, oh, yeah, I hate crack. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, that's... Oh. Yeah. I mean, 
I, I've told this story before, but not here, obviously, is I, um, when my publisher, Bear Manor Media, at, they, he found out that I had all the crack magazines. I also have every mad and every sick, every, you know, because I've been collecting forever. And uh, he, he, when he found out I have every crack, you want to do a history on crack? And my response was, does anybody really care? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't want to do it. <clears throat> and, uh, Fortunately, uh, Facebook was kind of in its infancy, but it was kind of branching out. And I knew a few people out there, and I just kind of put some feelers. Would you buy a book about Cracked Magazine? And surprisingly, I got responses from people who actually worked at Cracked. Yeah. And more importantly, people who just read Cracked who said, I like Cracked better than Mad. I don't, you know, Mad was always a little too sophisticated for me. I like the just the general kind of dumbed down humor for lack of a better term you know of cracked and i go okay for me i just always thought it was a second rate mad but you know and we're talking before mark todd um yeah. you know it was like a second rate mad and the only saving graces that had john severin mm -hmm. um mort todd did take it to a different level and um the issues after mort todd left because they were edited by lou silverstone uh jerry defuccio and Andy Simmons, they're pretty much, it was just another mad at the same time as mad for the 90s. Yeah. So um, I do like all those later issues a lot. So. Yeah, well, it's funny, Mort Todd even talks about Cracked isn't anybody's favorite magazine. Mad is your favorite magazine. <laughs> you know, yeah, and so it's, um, I don't know, that's, I, that's why I really liked talking about him, or talking to him about his work there is like one, I mean, it did bring me a, a greater appreciation for the magazine, yeah. but also like, Hey, I'm not completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> with having it be my, my second favorite humor magazine. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Another question from the audience. When's the bill Ward book coming out? Well, I'm not working on a bill Ward book, but I know what he's probably meaning. Um, doing another book just like this with uh, the comedy of Bill Ward or whatever we do. Um, uh, I will say this. Um, Mort and I were talking about reissuing a bill Ward book that he did uh, prior to him knowing me sometime, I think, in the 90s. It's kind of like a magazine, but redo it like in the... the deluxe format like those other books uh the only thing that really went wrong i mean is that we've had this pandemic so yeah. um it kind of threw everything kind of for the loop this uh kickstarter and everything happened right before everything shut down and everything and so yeah we've talked about doing another kickstarter and you know another book and talked about yeah doing a bill ward one or doing one with shut ups or uh, in fact we did do scan the material for the shut ups one uh but we just haven't done it yet so um i don't know i'll have to contact mort again but yeah that is in the planning i'll say that yeah well i mean what's cool about it is um like having easier access to all of that material, Mad Magazine, because of like the, the print volume that they were dealing with, it's pretty easy to compile a collection of Mad Magazines. I found, um, you know, now I'm, I am actually seeking out cracked magazines to start collecting, and they're a lot harder to come by than Mad are, so. Yeah. I mean, with few exceptions, they did reprint a lot of their stuff frequently. That was, that's the good thing about Cracked. Uh, usually the stuff that they didn't reprint is stuff that was really topical. Like, for some reason, they did a lot of John F. Kennedy humor right before he got shot. And yeah. there was even some articles that they actually had to kind of touch up and put glasses and false hair and beards on kennedy's face to obscure him so they could run the uh, basically a finished article and just which unfortunately also changed the humor because originally it, it made more sense to have kennedy in the page but on yeah. the page but hey if you've already got the artwork done just doing a little touch up there just to get published i guess that's what they did but a lot yeah. of that stuff was never reprinted later so um, oh wait so 
Uh, wait, I, I think I became confused momentarily. So are you saying that they had already published and then they altered it in light they, of no, the assassination? They, they altered, or it was... They altered it after after he was assassinated, but they never bothered to reprint it again. It was all, always okay. altered, but you could tell okay. it was altered if you look yeah. at it. I have examples in the book. He's got like a Van Dyke and, beard or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's really Just throw a beret on it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, granted, Mad has not been too heavy on reprinting old material of older politicians. Even when they do, Mad takes on politics. It's always like the politicians of the last 20, 30 years. They don't go back and do a bunch of Truman jokes, let's say. So, yeah. you know, I kind of wish they would. I mean, especially since now they're all in reprint. I mean, the one I would love to see since somebody said Bill Ward, and they never have ever done this, is I would like to see... Uh, the best of Wally Wood, not the m comic book material, because they already did that. Uh, yeah. I mean, the magazine material, because Wally Wood was there from 55 to 64. And, you know, they've, they've done best ofs for like every other artist. And I know why they haven't in the past, because Wally Wood kind of left under kind of, you know, not so favorable terms, I'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but he's revered, especially if you're a fan of EC Comics or just in general fandom. He's considered one of the best artists of all time. And for Mad to just kind of ignore somebody that drew for them for uh, over a decade, you know, it's just kind of strange. Yeah, I think that, that you know, that I imagine that that was all sort of like held over emotions or opinions from the New York crew. Yeah. And, you know, maybe one of the silver linings of the move to um what is it called burbank california yeah. you know is that like well you know now we can just do it <laughs> there, right. there's nobody to you know be offended on somebody's behalf because we're reprinting this material or now revering somebody that should have been revered for quite a while um there were a few wait um well here we have a comment no van skyver <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I will agree. I will agree to that comment to this aspect of it. Um, uh, before he was redesigned, Sylvester Smith was really, really ugly in the first ten issues of Crack. Yeah, and, well, it's like uh, that that one you held up. He is pretty grotesque. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then, you know, and I'll use the one that's on the cover of the book. Um, you know, then they, he kind of made him a likable fellow here. And yeah. um, I have an example um, from one of the Marx Brothers movies that I think that Severin kind of modeled the later Sylvester onto Harpo Marx. There's no exact proof of that, but I show an example of Harpo Marx in a painter's outfit from one of their movies. I forgot which one, it's Day of the Races or one of them. It says in the book. <laughs> That's why I write books. I don't have to remember all this stuff. Uh, you know, and when you look at it, you go, yeah, I think, it, you know, it, but... Uh, it was never confirmed or denied by John Severin, even though I interviewed him for the book. Uh, so, you know, it, it just, there was no memory one way or the other. So, you know, it's like, so it'll be a mystery, but um, I don't know. Is Alfred E. Newman good looking? <laughs> you know, he has those, those eyes that you, you know. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe Sylvester just edges him out on the least appealing. Right. Um, I think there's... Uh, there, all right, we'll do Bill Ward. You've spoken. <laughs> the audience has spoken. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, we do... We have that under consideration, so that was truly... Uh, but going back to Sylvester, it's like, I don't know, there are far worse... Uh, I think it was the magazine called Frenzy. It's some guy who, who looks kind of like Ernie Kovacs, and he has, like, two antenna on the top of his head. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you ever got the magazine called Thwack that uh, no. Martin Jalad and Scott Gosar did right before they worked at Crack in the uh, early OOs. Um, okay. They, they uh, did this magazine called Thwack, which is based on a Don Martin sound effect. And on the cover of one of their issues, they put every mascot you, that ever was on any magazine. So it has Irving Forbush from Snafu. It has the Nebish from Crazy. Um, I think Obnoxio the Clown was on it. You know, every one of them. And it's like, no, all these characters aren't very good. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, like, uh, mascots are supposed to, like, bring readers in or bring fans in. Um, my crack, I read crack actually it, it, it had three mascots, and they had a second one who was just the editor, and he was, like, this sleazy, cigar-chomping editor who had, like, a top hat and a beard. Yeah. And uh, then the third one was just this like sexy model named Veronica or something. And she didn't really do much, but all those ones were gone after like the first 10 issues and it just became Sylvester. So. Oh, okay. Oh, so it wasn't <laughs> like, um, at first when you were talking about like the lady, I thought it would be, was it Nanny Dickering? No, that was later. Yeah. Yeah. She, okay. She was never considered a mascot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she would be considered a memorable character like Hugh and Dini or any of the other ones of, you know, spies versus saboteurs and things like that. But <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah, uh, you are working right now on a mad book. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. So is this, tell me a little bit about that because I'm curious if it's going to be, yeah, just you, I well, don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> once again, I didn't want to do one. I, I'm that way with my publisher. Bear Manor has published most of my books and, he comes up with this idea. He wanted me to do a mad book even before I did the cracked one, and I didn't want to do one. Uh, but, you know, mad has changed so much in the last decade. It's like, and now that it's reprint only, you go, hmm, maybe the time has come. And so I did start working on it. Uh, and I realized that every mad book that really went out there to do the history uh, pretty much only goes to the 90s. It doesn't really cover the last 30 years very well. Yeah. Um, and even the, the most recent book, uh, there's like this scholarly book that came out last year. It has the briefest of histories. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, yeah. I, don't know, yeah. Uh, I was I looking forget. for it. I yeah, don't have it the, at hand. The red book. I have it in the other room, but you know. Yeah. Uh, but it's a very scholarly thing, and it has like uh, personal stories and mad significance in society and how it relates and all that stuff. I don't typically write that way. You know, I'm yeah. more. If you read my crack book, I'm more of a straightforward, you know, this is the history. This is what happened. I'm like a news reporter. I want to get as many interviews as I can. Uh, granted, uh, like when I did my Harvey Comics Companion, a lot of the creators are now gone. Fortunately, yeah. I have some interviews I did prior to them passing, but also there are other interviews that are in print. And th there's no problem, you know taking some of those quotes as long as I attribute them. So I'm taking William M. Gaines quotes from Comics Journal, things like that, and, you know, having a complete bibliography, you know. Would I have loved to have interviewed William Gaines? Of course, you know, but, you know, sometimes you have to resort to different methods when not everyone else is here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like interviewing Morrison, like we said, you know, quotes from that podcast interview will make it into the book. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed, uh, you know, various other people and then trying to get as many that are still around. Yeah. Uh, you know, I interviewed Al Jaffe for the crack book. Um, I've talked to Sergio many times. Um, I can't think of all the old timers who are still around. I mean, I, you know, I hate to say you like we lost one today who's on the fringes of mad is Stephen Sondheim, who is a lyricist oh. for the mad show. Yeah, he passed away today. So it's like, they're going. You know? And I do talk about that. Um, that's one thing I'm, I'm covering is literally everyone. Uh, and I will say this Doug Guilford's mad website is a godsend. I'm not just cribbing it completely. But <laughs> <laughs> um, it's helped because, you know, you know, to having the complete list of uh, the um, usual gang of idiots is just like, oh, wow. I don't know if I would be able to look through all the issues as thoroughly as that. It would probably have taken me 10 times as long to do it. With his website, I can kind of cross check and say, ah, there's the first lighter side. But what yeah. I'm doing is going one step further. I shouldn't reveal all this stuff. Doug will be knocking on my door. Can you tell me this stuff? No. You can get it out of my book after it's published. Um, I went one step further and uh, put the very first appearance where he calls his uh, bird self caricature Roger Kaputnik, and mm. uh, which isn't listed. You know, there's things like that. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to be more thorough about things. I'm also trying to write, uh, and we kind of mentioned this uh, when we're talking about Morrison. 
other things mad creators have done. I mean, a lot of people just know like Don Martin from Mad, or maybe Cracked, uh, but they don't know that he did jazz albums for Miles Davis or, you know, any number of things. Yeah. Um, and so I try to, and especially when Mad had like a revolving door of usual gang of idiots, especially in the last 20 years, because, you know, it's, you, Mad used to be the be all end all, and that's where everybody stayed. Now, kind of Mad is like the stepping stone. And so you find out these people did, uh, you know, worked at Mad for four or five years, and then they went on and created this hit show for Nickelodeon or something. And, you know, yeah. so I tried to talk about that, uh, which wasn't really discussed in previous Mad histories because. Uh, in 1994, when a lot of them were done, the the Reichelbach one or whatever her name is, uh, and then uh, Dick DePartola's book, and yeah, you know, like even Good Frank Days Jenkins and Mad, book, and then yeah, those are all yeah. like to mid 90s, and so most of the classic Mad staff is still working or alive at the very least, you know. <laughs> so yeah. you know, and, and uh, so that's what I'm trying to do now. For people to say, well, you know, what about those old guys? Well, I'm trying not to just rehash the same first 30 years either. The, the only thing that takes so long in this book is I realized I'm doing a mad book. This is the longest chunk of time <laughs> I've had to work for a book, meaning um, mad started in 1952 and it's still going. Yeah. And that's like 70 years here. Um when I did my Harvey book, it covered about 40 years. When I did Crack, it was about 45 years. So this is twice as much time, and it's stuff that came out regularly over the last 70 years. It wasn't like, uh, you know, the way it is like right now, where there's like just six issues a year and maybe a Christmas special. You know, there yeah. was a lot of stuff that has come out in the last 70 years. So, so when it when it comes to like, um, and you're an, you're an independent historian, Right. Yep. Um, yep. When I think about Good Days and Mad, you know, mm -hmm. Dick D. Bartolo is writing that. He's he's a company man. He's been there, like forever. Uh, and even that the other one, um, completely mad. I think it's like on my just on my floor over there. Um, you know that that's like a. Um, uh, uh, I think like Matt had a hand in publishing that, right? Yeah, so, I mean, and and that's one thing I think I have a leg up on everyone else is I'm, I'm a true fan, but I do care about the material. I'm not trying to just go out there and just say, eh, Mad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm also not an insider, but I think that gives me a certain advantage because, you know, to criticize Mad or even any publication that's homegrown or internal. You know, be it an Archie comic book history or a DC comic book history or Marvel or whatever that's made by Archie DC or Marvel. Um, there's like a little bit of self congratulatory self promotion about it that, you know, maybe, you know, not, they may not even be aware of, or yeah. it may be on purpose. It's like, well, don't tell them about the skeletons in the closet here, you know, like I mentioned Wally Wood and I interviewed this man who is a curator uh, for all the Wally Wood material, uh, David Spurlock. And he get, and he did a podcast episode, so you can listen to it now. And he gave me uh, the nitty gritty of what really caused Wally Wood to leave MAD and start working for Marvel and then working independently and everything like that after 1964. Um, it's not a very flattering story, and you know, so Mad doesn't really want it. You know, I could disclose it here, but I want you to be surprised, or you can listen to the podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, well, yeah, and I wonder that too about. Um, I, I, I'm very bad with names, but you know, so when Harvey Kurtzman, uh, he make he's like, like, we have to switch it to a magazine format, and then he's kind of pushed out by, uh, and re well, he's replaced by. Who's he replaced? It starts Feld, with an F. Feldstein. Feldstein. Alan Feldstein. You know, and it's um, like that. I I'm curious as to you know how that's portrayed by Mad Magazine versus how that how things actually happened. And I think like that we we do have like some information about, 
Um, and, you know, we kind of know how Harvey felt about that. But when it comes to like Mad talking about Harvey, you know, it's that gets brushed over yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they, they changed their tune over the years, you know. I mean, I'll have to admit, and this is probably Gaines's uh, reason for doing it. Uh, after Harvey left and took all the staff with him, except for Wally Wood, um, basically, um, Gaines just kind of washed his hands of Kurtzman for almost two decades. So, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't until 1972 when um, two things happened in 1972. They had the EC fan convention and uh, all the old EC people came back. And... I'm sure Gaines knew that he would have to re-encounter Kurtzman. The uh, yeah. second thing is, you know, uh, there's a wave of 50s nostalgia already happening, and that's when Mad started doing those nostalgic Mad reprints. Yeah. Um, Gaines probably knew, I won't be able to reprint these things without a big fuss from Kurtzman unless I make peace with this guy. So, yeah. 72, I think, they, they, they mended their fences, and uh, so Kurtzman was kind of invited back into the club and you know throughout the 70s they did those nostalgic mad reprints which for the longest time was the only way you could get those old kurtzman comic book uh reprints other than a few paperbacks at the beginning now yeah. of course they've reprinted the original 23 comic books 10 different formats you know magazine black and white book color book you know <laughs> yeah digital whatever you know it's like but you know you know, it's, it's kind of weird how that changed. So now, you know, he's revered in his, you know, but the weird thing that's kind of happened since Feldstein's tenure, which was approximately 56 to 84, is he's kind of now brushed under the carpet. Like, he didn't do all that much. And it's like, yeah. well, I, I'm a Feldstein fan. I'm a, I'm a Kurtzman fan, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, people always ask, you know, it's like, when did Mad go bad, in your opinion? You know, and the joke is always, it's always the best, the issue before you started reading it, you know, <laughs> or or the other alternative answer is it's best when you're 11 years old. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I think it's actually, I started reading in 1974, and I think something really left Mad, and I reread all the issues in the last year, the standard size issue something really left after Kurt, after Feldstein left. Mm -hmm. But I have to give Picard and Meglin some kudos because they kind of kept it going in his format for a few more years after that. Uh, but then after Meglin left, it really changed. And I hate to say I'm not the hugest John Ficarra fan. Because <laughs> yeah. um, he changed it dramatically. I mean, he put advertising in it, he put color pages. I think a lot of that is... And he put out a zillion paperbacks oversized this that and the other and i think he kind of oversaturated the market which is unfortunate because now we're at the complete opposite where there's like nothing on the market yeah <laughs> i want to so, go back to that idea what you were saying about like like kind of overcorrecting and maybe um uh feldstein not you know then you know his uh legacy being chipped away at mm -hmm. um like one thing i think about is um with Bill Kane and Bob Finger, or Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Um, and how, you know, it's like maybe in like the last 15 years, more people got this understanding of who Bill Finger was and kind of how he got screwed over in the deal. And, um, oh, I guess for people who don't know, you know, Bob Kane was known as the creator of Batman, but it turned out Bill Finger had a lot of input on the character design. He did a, a lot of the um, the writing of it, creating all of these new characters. The, a lot of the characters that we are like the big part of the rogues gallery. Um, yeah. But he didn't get credit for it at the time. And he, he died a poor man uh, yeah. because of that. Uh, but then it's like, after that news came out, it's like, oh, Bob Kane didn't do shit. <laughs> He's horrible. <laughs> He's the worst. Oh, you know, it's like, well, maybe they both contributed. Yeah. To what extent, who knows? But, yeah. you know, the character that we love is mm -hmm. because of both of those people. And yeah. Mad Magazine, much the same. Like, you know, it's... You, you find yeah. this all over comic books. 
I mean, I hate to say it, um, that one guy hogs all the credit, then it comes out later that so-and-so else had a lot to do with it. And then the original person that hogged all the credit is maligned that, like, he never had anything to do with it at all. The yeah. the most notorious current example probably is Stan Lee. And Steve um, Ditko and yeah, Jack Kirby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, my opinion, uh, since, well, I never met Steve Ditko, but I actually uh, communi- I inter- I communicated with him for the crack book. He wrote my forward. It's kind of a joke, but mm-hmm. you'll get it when you see it if you look at my book. But um, right. but I reached out to him, and I talked to Mort Todd about Steve Ditko. And uh, it wasn't that Steve Ditko didn't want to talk about Spider-Man. He just wasn't a very open guy to talk to fans. But if you went up to him, like if you were working with him, Mort Todd may have said this on the podcast, it's like, he'd talk your ear off. You know, it's like if you asked him about Spider-Man, he'd blah, 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 blah. So I was asking him about Robot Wars for the Crackbook. Well, it wasn't a big significant thing for Ditko, but I figured I wasn't doing my due diligence unless I asked him. But my point of saying that is I met Kirby, I met Stanley a few times, and I communicated with Ditko. And my conclusion is I think... uh Ditko and Kirby had a lot to do with a lot of those characters, but they wouldn't have gotten them done, published without Stan Lee. And yeah. that's the thing people always forget. It's like, yeah, Siegel and Schuster had this wonderful idea about this super heroic uh, being from another planet. Well, if you don't have a publishing powerhouse of national periodical publications, you don't have shit. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like... Um, it's the same thing, you know, is it, with MAD, um, Kurtzman has gone on record saying, I did it all myself. Uh, Gaines went on record, I've done it all myself. Feldstein came up, uh, and it's on record in Geisman's book that, you know, he gave the idea to uh, Kurtzman to do because he needed, you know, more income. He was just doing frontline combat and uh, Two-Fisted Tales. And yeah. MAD would give him more income and so he gave him that idea that's feldstein's thing i don't know what's true and when i do this in my books and uh you know i did this in my harvey book because that's a good example there too uh there are a lot of people that claim to have created richie rich which is their most popular character uh the the descendants of alfred harvey the founder of the company say it was our father alone that did richie rich (laughs) and then this artist who drew him for a long period of time it was our dad, Warren Kramer, who did it. You know, and I think the ultimate answer, which probably is the case on a lot of these things, uh, no matter what what company you're talking about, DC, Marvel, Archie, whatever, man, um, is a lot of times this stuff uh, is formed by committee. On the Harvey book, there's a man who also drew Richie Rich, and I asked him about it. Who do you think created R- uh, Richie Rich? And he says, I, you know, he's passed away, but he, when I interviewed him, he says, I seem to remember we had a, a weekly meeting and we were discussing new characters and everybody just suggested different ones that they were thinking about or whatever. Yeah, now, the most mundane answer. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of these things are done by committee. It's like, you know, hmm, we need to do another publication. Well, we're already, you know, the, I don't know if the conversation went like this, but let's go back in time and make a fictional EC Comics meeting. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll be so, I'll be Harvey Kurtzman. Okay. You uh, be Will okay. Gaines. Okay. Uh, so Kurtzman, you you want to huh? uh, you, Kurtzman, you want to increase your income here, right? Yeah, that'd be great, boss. Yeah, and you don't like it that Feldstein here has uh, seven titles. Uh, three, no, that bastard. He's three, taking food from titles, my mouth. Three, two science fiction titles, and uh, I don't remember the other two. But you know, we publish a lot of titles, and he's making seven times your income practically because yeah. you only get. Two lousy war titles out every much that don't sell very well don't i get a piece yeah well i can't give you some of his titles because you, you're editing you're not editing his books you don't even do artwork for his books so i can't give you anything there why don't you come up with another book you know uh say you did humor before uh you did uh, uh anything for us you did, hey i think hey, you're look, right you know? i did yeah. yeah why don't you do something like hey look there you know it's like you made us roll on the floor in the offices so it's like you know why don't you do that you know that's hey, a swell say, idea boss think about that oh oh yeah i told him to do that you know it's like oh okay you know it's like you know 
And that's probably how it came about. It was, ne- you know, it wasn't until it started making money. I did it all by myself. I <laughs> did it, you know. <laughs> Uh, no advanced cover. This is part of the committee, uh, and so I no, think we I all think we all get a little piece it. of that. Oh, you're making it up. I did it just because I stole your idea right now. <laughs> you shouldn't have told me before you copyrighted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, you know that you. I think you touched on it well, which is like the you know you have um, you know somebody like uh, what's his face, the guy Stanley. And then, you know, Steve Ditko or Jack Kirby. And it's like, they, you really do need both of those guys. Because, you know, like Steve Get Ditko, didn't he create like the question too? But the question wasn't that, did he? Um, I'm not Wh- sure which one am I one. thinking the, the of? The biggest ones I know are Amazing Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. Yeah. And even Stan Lee said in interviews that, you know, Doctor Strange kind of came out of left field and that was Ditko's thing all the way. So, you know, I don't think he even took... You know, but yeah. my point is for all this, for the conversation for our mad book, here, for the mad book here is I try not to put my opinion. And I, I took journalism in high school and, and some in college. And basically true, good, proper journalism is you present the facts and yeah. you let the reader draw their own conclusion. So in who originated mad? I'm going to have quotes from Kurtzman. I'm going to have quotes from Feldstein. I'm going to have quotes from Gaines. And uh, I'm going to have the facts as we know them from yeah. just when things were published, you know. And uh, but I'm not going to sit there and say, you know, specifically, categorically, it was all uh, Harvey Kurtzman by himself, and the other guys could take a flying leap because, you know, Harvey Kurtzman needed Bill Gaines as much as Bill Gaines needed Harvey Kurtzman. You know, you, you can see that with everything that Kurtzman did after Mad. You know, it's like he didn't have the same type of partner with Hefner or with uh, Jim Warren or anybody like that, or yeah. even going by his own devices with Humbug. And it's like, um, he just wasn't the businessman. And even if you go even like corporate stuff, like Disney or something, Walt Disney was the idea guy, but he would, he would be like a Kurtzman. You know, Kurtzman was an idea guy. But he didn't know beans about business. He overspent the company's money all the time. And uh, Walt Disney was, I mean, Roy Disney, the brother, was like Gaines. Gain, he had to reel him in and say, all right, you can do mad, but you got to do it. If you want to do it as a magazine, you got to do it in black and white. Because I don't have tons of magazine and money to throw around here, you know. So there yeah. was compromises he had to make. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I guess that was the point with Steve Ditko and the question, right? Is yeah. like that idea of like, well, what did Kurtzman do outside of Mad? Like his subsequent things. So like Kurtzman creates the question for like Charlton Comics, yeah. but you know it's a fun character, but it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't have the same legs. Yeah. He doesn't have that the same support uh, that he did with somebody like Stan Lee to yeah. guide Kurt, in whatever way the, that all the looked. new gods and all that other stuff at DC, and then later for Pacific Comics did Captain Victory. I saw yeah. Captain Victory when it first came out, and I said, what's not the big deal about this? I, you know, this guy's horrible, you know? <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I like the Kirby Marvel stuff, but, uh, you know, it's like, and I changed my opinion about it. I mean, I used to originally think that, you know, Stan Lee did write it all, you know, and yeah. then I understood the Marvel method, and so I go, okay, you know, I could see how the artist was writing it, too. But I think a lot of times the artist has to have a hand in it to, to get the story told properly if you're doing artwork, unless you're just an autonomous robot that's just kind of, you know, draw it like this, you know. I, I guess working for Kurtzman, you did do it that way because the original layouts Kurtzman did, he wanted them followed to the letter and didn't want them changed. So yeah. in that case, yes, you know, Kurtzman had a total hand in all those comic book issues of Mad, but the creation itself, he had some <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So um, with this history then, like you you said that an, an addition, one way it's going to differ is like showing the, the expanse of the artists in MAD. Like you said with um, um, the guy with the funny sound effects, how he did work for, uh, do you say Miles Davis? Don um, Martin, yeah. Don yeah. Martin, he, yeah. He did some album covers for the jazz musician miles davis back in the 50s yeah so you're gonna 
you'll show like that sort of like expansive extended yeah. universe but yeah. then going beyond 1990 um like what are some of the things that you want to touch on or like want to illuminate about this missing historical period oh since the 90s yeah um even though i think mad wasn't quite as good in the last 30 years it was still relevant Mm -hmm. And it's really a shame that it's in total reprints, except for an occasional page or two or the fold-in or whatever, the cover or something like that. It's like, yeah. why bother even publishing if you're going to do that? I would rather them go to four times a year and have it completely new or something, or have it half new, half reprint or something at the very least. Yeah. Um, I just think they're not taking advantage of the situation in the right way. And I don't know what to do to save it because it's been this way for two years now and i don't know if it's ever going to go back um but prior to that you know they they had some interesting artists come and go uh during the 90s and the oos and stuff like that but a lot of people may not know who they are just because of not them being there very long and I don't know if you get this if you talk to mad fans on Facebook or anything like that, but you know, I always say the new issues that I always promote it on my page and everything like that. And I say it's five ninety nine. And invariably some wag will say, Five ninety nine, that's outrageous. That's not cheap. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um well it's been five ninety nine longer than any other price, uh, which has been twelve years now. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of remarkable. Granted, twelve years ago they were all new material and blah 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 blah. But um, we'll not go into that. <laughs> the fact that uh, and five ninety nine is actually cheap for a magazine. Seriously cheap, not just doing Mad's thing. It's like, don't people buy magazines anymore? I guess they don't. But a lot of magazines are over ten dollars nowadays. You know, it's yeah. like and not and everything has gone up. I mean, a gallon of milk, a gallon of gas. Um, you know, it's I all ten dollars. I can't afford Mad. Well, uh, do you make the same amount of money with, that you made when Mad was thirty-five cents? I don't think so. You're probably a kid. So, you know, you just had discretionary income. <laughs> you know, it's like when Mad started, it was just turning to fifty cents. Yeah. You know? And uh, Mad has never been cheaper to produce. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, <laughs> my guess yeah. is, my guess is, now that it's all reprints. Yeah. You're, you're paying no artists. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. That, but the price doesn't go down because of that. And it's like uh, the reason why they could keep the price at five ninety nine is because they went to reprints. Had they kept all the artists and writers and everything now, that'd probably be 10 bucks, to be honest. You know, and uh, they might have to go back to black and white or put a lot more advertising because they really cut the advertising in the last few years, you know, after having a big influx of it. Yeah, I think that with, you know, that was something that I think a lot of people were bothered by when it happened. The ads, yeah. I was, I was a kid when it happened and I noticed it and, mm -hmm. but it didn't, it didn't really bother me because uh, I didn't really, I didn't know or appreciate that history of, you know, like sticking it to advertisements that Matt had and like then accepting them is a pretty dramatic turn. Um, but they, that went away. And either yeah. they became, they got their money from advertisements by doing, like, I guess, incorporating things into the covers or what I was always curious about. And I would love to know this is, you know, um, if later on after, you know, the advertising started happening, did they sell the, the, the movie or TV parody things? Like you, you could promote your, <laughs> your thing in mad this way. Well, the weird thing about, see, I worked in publishing. I worked in newspapers selling ads for a number of years. I don't do it now. Why don't I do it now? Because you can't make money at it anymore. Nobody yeah. buys newspapers anymore. Uh, this little thing that we're on called the internet has taken that away. And it's amazing that mad even exists on that score. Um, I know that a lot of the ads, because I told you, I went through every single issue and I really paid attention to the ads. And actually, I list them out every issue, even the ones that uh, I don't do it on the comic books because EC Comics had ads. OK, that's just yeah. what comic books did. But if there's ads in the first magazine issues, I list them out because there's ads for like Silly Putty and 
uh, phonographs and a couple other things in the earliest issues of Mad. Nobody mm-hmm. remembers it, but they were. But I think what happened then, and Feldstein talked about it, and happened again when they brought advertising back with Vicara, advertisers have to get a return on their investment. And if they don't, they will stop advertising. And you look at the Mad ads, and uh, when they brought them in originally, uh, I can tell that some of them were freebies because they're like public service announcements. And I go, yeah. they didn't pay for that ad. Nobody paid for that ad. They're just putting an ad in there. And then a lot of them are house ads for DC. Anything DC, that wasn't yeah. paid for. Uh, so, you know, they got a few video game ads in there, but even those might have been kickback things. It's like, hey, we'll give you a bunch of free games that you can give away in Mad uh, in exchange for an ad. So, I don't know how successful Mad really was when they were doing advertising. I think they got a few, but they had like anti-smoking PSAs, and yeah. um, and then it kind of went away. And then there was like a staff change. I was noticing, you know, when Mad got bigger and bigger, more involved with DC Comics, the DC Comics staff kept growing and growing and growing. And if you look at the staff boxes, uh, they had sometimes as many as thirty people listed in mad not really working for mad they're just like vps of this vp of advertising yeah. vp of this and vp of that and it's like wow none of these people are really working on mad and you meanwhile you see mads uh <laughs> had like seven editors at once and then they had six and then it kind of went down and the way it is now the dc staff on the current ones there's about 15 people because i think they laid off a lot of people right before covid and there's really just two people working on the magazine. Susie has yeah. Vincent and one other person. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And Susie's the de facto editor, even though she's just listed as art director. And uh, uh, so there's no time for anybody to sell ads because there's no staff to sell ads. So they won't have ads anymore. So, um well, even before, for, yeah. for mad fans, but I mean, for you know, income for mad to get from advertising they're not going to get it so yeah but the i i'm curious about that because if we look at um like even like a current comic book right like everything that's in there it's it's mostly house ads yeah and they'll have like maybe snickers or so like i i remember seeing yeah. that recently but like even mad magazine once they moved to california and i think preceding that they seem to have done away with ads almost entirely. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, they except had maybe for like a back cover one on occasion, but for the most yeah. part, they were done. Yeah. Well, and that's like you know, it's um, but, yeah. I, but but it, but it was done. I just wanted to make it clear: it wasn't done because we Mad fans said, "Oh, out- advertising a Mad that's outrageous." No, it was done because I don't think that the advertisers that were legit. We're getting any return on their investment because if it's yeah. a magazine of any uh, repute, they're not charging fifty cents for those ads. They're probably charging a few thousand dollars because well, it's full page and color, and you get the circulation of this amount. Well, yeah. the problem is if you don't deliver on that circulation. Let's say they said, "Oh, Mad's selling five hundred thousand copies, and it's really selling a hundred thousand, which is what it really sells about nowadays, or even less." Yeah. Uh, you know then you'd have to start doing make good ads and stuff and freebies to justify, well, you know, you didn't get a uh, 500,000 eyes on this one, but if we run you in the next five issues, that'll compensate one. Oh, sure. Yeah. So now they're suddenly free, you know, yeah. Such as life with advertising. So yeah. that's why it's hard to make money on advertising nowadays in the old days, you know, like if mad actually had advertising, I mean, realize, I, I don't know if they actually did with like the mad magazine game with Parker brothers. Those are probably just freebies then too, but, Let's say Parker Brothers, when the Mad Magazine game came out, actually paid for an ad in Mad Magazine. Yeah. Back then, the magazine was selling over a million copies. Um, they probably could uh, fairly ask like ten thousand dollars for that ad, and that would have paid for the issue and then some. You know, that would have paid for the whole year's run of issues back then. And <laughs> that you you wouldn't even need to have. Uh, a price tag you could have given away mad for free but of course mad at that time was probably about 90 cents i think you know? yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> um, so what do you think um that kyle had a comment oh look hey doug guilford's here hey i don't i don't know what that's in 
reference to? Jaffe, Jaffe Dodge, Dodge uh, folding. folding back covers. Oh, yeah. Well, those were legit uh, ads. I bet Dodge oh, did pay. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, I know what he's talking about. Jaffe yeah. did a couple fold-in. It, it's funny. Some issues, he did a, a regular fold-in, and he did an advertising fold-in. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's like, how did he manage to do that? Because <laughs> he did that a few times about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I remember seeing one, and uh, I think on a recent issue, and I was so I was like perplexed by it. I was like, I I hate this, and I was like, oh wait, it's an ad. I yeah. hate it more now. Yeah. <laughs> they might have got legitimate money out of that one, but you know, it's like that's it's still again a decade ago, and so yeah. you know, I don't. Know. Um, well, so this go is back to comic format. Yeah, you know? yeah. Cool. Maybe, what do you comic books don't sell either so <laughs> yeah <laughs> but what do you I, think? I think Matt should go back on newsstands but you know and um, if anything if you're going to make it a reprint make it like the reprint books you know and, and instead of having the same christmas stocking that they seem to reissue year after year actually come up with a few new books that they've never done before like i said the wallywood one or something else tackle a subject you've never done you know Mad looks at fish or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that with those the stocking stuffers, it's almost um, entirely just like a, a hail mary pass, or like just a little bit more money uh, based on nostalgia. Like uh, a mom or a dad will be like, "Oh, I remember Mad. This will be yeah. fun," and they'll grab it and you know. But Mad did more kid. Christmas or holiday material than that issue. It seems like they could at least have like three issues worth to rotate around instead of having the exact same issue every year. I think they changed it up a few years ago, but the current one that's out on the stands right now is the exact same one as last year's. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, it's unless you're hardcore, not like me, you have to have every version, which I do, you know, it's like, (laughs) it's a waste of money, you know? And that's when people go 1399. That's not cheap. Well, yeah, it's not when it, you could have bought last year for 1399. (laughs) <laughs> unless you needed to say 2022 on it which it does so there we go <laughs> yeah uh, but could you imagine um a world in which we have mad magazine back doing new material is there something that you would want to see or that you would if somebody called you up and they were like we need your advice mr arnold uh we're going back what should we do to to be successful Bring back Al Feltz. No. <laughs> no. Um, no. Um, I used to do this when I used to publish a fanzine years ago as the first event foray into publishing for myself called the Harveyville Fun Times. And Harvey stopped publishing in 1994. And I used to do a regular editorial every so often. What would I do if I published Harvey? Because it was all hypothetical. And I used to say this then. It's like, and I still agree with that for now is I think they should publish digest reprints like Archie does and mm. get back on the stands. Now, Man's not a comic book. It hasn't been forever. Um, it's still a magazine. Uh, if I was running magazine, uh, running Mad Magazine, I would get it back on regular uh, newsstand distribution. Uh, I would maybe not have a full all-new issue unless sales were just going through the roof. But the thing that is killing me on having new material in MAD is they can have reprint articles all day long of just their generic articles because unless you're a hardcore reader, if it's a reprint from the last 50 to 70 years, you may not have seen it before. You know, I always tell people, if you haven't bought MAD since it was 35 cents, you got 50 years of material you haven't seen. So, but what, I think is missing right now on mad is the movie and TV parodies. And, mm. uh, I think they should go back to doing more adult movie parodies because as yeah, much like as pornos. I like Tom Richmond's and Desmond Devlin's parodies, the last decade before they stopped doing them seem to be like every Marvel superhero or DC superhero movie of the month. And those are hard movies to parody because it's just basically, superheroes fighting each other i know there's the appeal there oh boy batman has it oh boy green lantern oh aquaman oh Man. spider-man oh you know dr strange blah. you know i get it but you know did they do a a, a a parody of hidden figures no did they do a parody of uh green book no 
Uh, did they do a, a parody of any of the Oscar-winning pictures of the last decade? I don't think so. I think maybe the Lord of the Rings, just because that one happened to win Best Picture, was the last one uh, that they did. Um, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you, I would read parodies of movies that I never saw for a long time because I started at age seven. I didn't see Death Wish for years. I didn't yeah. see Midnight Cowboy for years. I didn't see Clockwork Orange. I didn't see... But, you know, it's like they did parodies of them, and I read the parodies, so I knew the parody before I saw the actual film. When I actually saw the film, I go, ah, now I get that joke better because I get it. Well, I, some... I think, yeah, with with the parodies, um, I agree with you because, like, one thing that bothers me is, um, like, going through my collection of the last, past few decades um, – all the covers, there's not, there's no visual gags. Like I, I love, um, you know, seeing the ones like Fink's Donuts where he has a sandwich board and the yeah. whole of the donut he sees right through him, right? Like Norman yeah. Mingo is great at these. Um, and then it turned into only whatever movie was out. Right. It's that character yeah, numinized. Yeah, it's Alfred as Wolverine. It's Alfred yeah. as uh, Batman. It's Alfred as Robin the next time. It's Alfred as Batgirl the next time. It's a <laughs> yeah. And the thing that you know the old Mads had, which is I found interesting, like especially going through these old ones that I've never seen before. I didn't grow up in that era. It's like you get these movies that, like you said, some like West Side Story. You know, it's like, well, this is great. It's a it's a masterpiece as a movie. Um, and then this is funny because it's lampooning it. But then you also get the ones that um, were shitty movies and nobody saw because <laughs> they had to kind of guess what would be relevant. And sometimes they guessed wrong with the TV or movies. I think they see like, well, uh, this will be a blockbuster. Lord of the Rings, okay. Uh, we can do all of those. Oh, a new Batman movie's coming out? Yes, we can do that. That'll be a blockbuster. People will see it. And you get, I guess, the eyes on it, but you don't, like, it's almost, you can't do things exclusively for posterity, but it, it you are losing something beyond that by ignoring these other great ones. Yeah. Um, um, and, yeah, they didn't always pick winners. I mean... Yeah. Uh, Crack was notorious on that one. That's the one thing that can come up. I can't think of a mad one, but I know there are some mad ones. But like Crack did a cover in 1975 for this movie called Capone. And I asked them, why did you do a cover on Capone? And it's like, well, we, The Godfather and Godfather 2 were big, big smash hit movies. So we thought Capone would be a hit too. And we loved The Godfather movies. Now, Matt yeah. didn't do a parody of Capone, but I'm just using it as an example that just came to my head of a very obscure movie that you'd probably be able to find on Netflix, maybe, or DVD or somewhere now. But back in the 70s, if you didn't see it, forget it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, but that, that's my point about all this stuff. It's like, you know, the, Martin Scorsese is the Irishman. Matt should have done a parody of that one. Um, uh, I think think they were a little bit better on tv shows in recent times before they went to all reprint but i mean like the latest issue they're doing a reprint on the exorcist granted it's a halloween issue and stuff like that but i mean who are they targeting here you know that's what i want to know i mean if they're targeting kids what kid knows about the exorcist if they're targeting adults chances are they probably have seen that parody somewhere along the line um, in the last 50 years because it's been reprinted quite a bit yeah, well, and that's um, this is Kyle. Uh, do you do you know Kyle Bridget? I know the name. I'm not known. All right, he's a Kyle he's mad personally. contributor, uh, friend of the show. Uh, but I mean, this is kind of the point you're talking to. Is like the problem with Mark and Doug's demographic is only half of Matt's core demographic. The other half is 11 year olds. There is this um, th like a, the vocal demographic is mm -hmm. old dudes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, you know, like you know, we want things as we remember them. Um, but then at the same, and I mean, the thing old people have going for them is disposable income, which yeah. 11 year olds yeah. do not have. Yeah. Well, that's uh, why I was saying, you know, up at, you know, it's like match and parody do new parodies of R rated movies um, that are popular. Yeah. Um, why? Because I mean, 
first of all, I you know I I hate to be really down on our youth of today, but I will be for the <laughs> sake of my argument. I always think, do eleven year olds even read? I always think that they don't read anything and probably play video games all along. That might be a grotesque stereotype, but I don't know yeah. eleven year olds personally. <laughs> so, but that's my impression. So yeah. if you are targeting a magazine to somebody who's not even reading it, regardless if they have disposable income or not, it's pointless. Um, yeah. Well, you know, this it, is. I'll I'll say this is I, I know a lot of eleven year olds because uh, I teach that age. You teach, okay? So uh, are any of them sneaking mad in class like we did when I was eleven? No, no, they don't. They don't care about mad um, because you know they can't find mad. Um, but they the thing is is that demographic they are voracious readers. Yeah. But the thing that um, you know, so they don't. But they don't want things aimed at them. It's like there yeah. was this whole thing with like. Um, uh, you know, YA literature, right? Uh, you know, with the Hunger Games. And that bubble burst because it just got saturated with the stuff that really, it was aimed too much at them. Like the, the ones that really broke through, like the Hunger Games, like pushed the envelope a little bit and yeah. made the kids feel a little dangerous reading it. And that's what, as a kid, when you read Mad, I think making it seem a little dangerous, like seeing, you know, cartoon boobs yeah, so it was when, like yeah exactly when I became, okay when i came this is why i became a mad reader right here. yeah okay it was in 1974 i may have seen mad on the stands before i don't know but i didn't pay attention to it i, I did read comic books and it was my sister who pointed it out as mad super special number 14 that had the don martin wild art posters and on the cover it has nude i mean it's drawing by don martin uh poster that says protect our wildlife and i'm like seven years old i think i see a titty you know and it's like <laughs> i want to buy this and i bring it to my mom and she goes all right that looks funny she, yeah my mom was never prudish about stuff like that if i wanted it you know because uh, i was buying national lampoon by the time i was 10 so you know and i still bought mad so i was always wanting the next thing and when mad honestly when mad started dumbing down you know Granted, I'm now in my 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, when it starts dumbing down and doing all the Harry Potter movies and all those Hunger Games movies and all the Lord of the Rings movies and all those superhero movies. And it's like, yeah, it's like, man wouldn't have done this in the past. They would have tried to, you know, put stuff like Death Wish, I mean, I, you know, or Exorcist or, you know, Midnight Cowboy. Midnight Cowboy was an X rated movie when it came out, not dirty, dirty, dirty. It was just. The, the original rating system was G, M, and X. And yeah. that got changed to G, P, G, R, and X. And later they added PG-13. But um, my point is, you know, it's still packed a wallop to have an X-rated film in a Mad magazine. Mad, yeah. wasn't, Mad wasn't parodying the love bug. They weren't doing Disney films back then. Uh, if you wanted parodies and stuff like that, you probably would have to read Dynamite or maybe Bananas. But even then, they were they were trying they were all trying to emulate Mad, so they weren't doing the kid films. You know, there you never saw a Disney film in Mad uh, until like like you'd think they would have done Mary Poppins way back when. No, I I remember <laughs> it was uh, like Hunchback of Notre Dame. I think they yeah, did. Sam Viviano the, the would do those. Films yeah, something. you know, and then. If you want to know when they did it way back when, you have to go back to like 20,000 Leaks Under the Sea, you know, yeah. way back in the 50s. So it's like they didn't do Disney films. And it's like, I think Mad was better for it to be more sophisticated, to get younger kids something to aspire to. And it's like, ooh, this is kind of dirty, you know. It's yeah. like, I remember the, some of the Mads when, uh, well, I got the Mads, uh, I'm going to say something about mine. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess. <laughs> Some of the Mads that came out in the mid '70s, they didn't really have nudity, but I remember they did a. This was in 1975. They did like a photography magazine. Yeah. And they had a, a lady with photos you could take pictures of in the photography magazine parody, and she wasn't showing any nipple or anything. She was just, you know, you know, having her bra strap off her shoulder or something. But as a ten-year-old, nine-year-old kid, I was like, "Oh my God, she's almost nude!" You know, yeah. <laughs> so it was like an incentive to buy the stuff, you know. And somebody mentioned manga on there. I think, uh, unless I'm wrong about what manga kids read, a lot of those are pretty adult. 
uh, not all of them, but you know, I, I know they, about them. No, they do. They push yeah. the they push the envelope. Like even yeah. the stuff that's meant for like younger. They you know, there's like this whole word world of it that I don't totally understand. But like even the things that are meant for kids, push mm-hmm. the envelope. You know, mm-hmm. and it's um, yeah, I think that that's a one of the reasons why kids enjoy it. Well, and also just like that Japanese culture is like very big in like the kids, you know, zeitgeist. I don't know if I'm using that word right. (laughs) No. For me, that's the thing I would do if I was publishing Mad. Now, the hard part about Mad now, or any parody magazine, because when I was a kid, they had Mad, Crack, Crazy, Sick, National Lampoon, uh, and then other ones like Trash Parody, uh, Up Your Nose and Out Your Ear, or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, All these weird ones. Bananas, Dynamite, and everything like that. It's like, We've been so inundated with parody and satire for the last half decade that it's like there's nothing new under the sun. You know, it's like yeah. and uh, you can have a parody about something instantaneously on the Internet. We could do one right here about, say, like the Beatles Get Back film, you know, because it's on now. Uh, whereas yeah. if Mad was doing a parody about that film, it'll be two months. So the Mandalorian or something, it'd be another two, three months before they'd get it written and on the stands. And so by that time, it's totally old news. Um, uh, I, I think that's kind of one of the reasons why, and also our interests, it used to be like three networks, like everybody says, you know, very few movies, blah, blah, blah. And there was like this mean stream. Now you got stuff on YouTube, you got stuff on uh, TikTok, you got stuff over here, you know, nobody, you know, we got this show we're doing right now. We got all the other shows and other podcasts and, uh, it's, everything's all over the place and there's no like centralized, this is U S culture as of 2020, you yeah. know, 2021, whatever, you know, it's like, it's just all over the map. So it's harder to like, poke fun at everything uh a third issue is just our total pc culture but that's been going on since the beginning of time you know that yeah. something that happened 50 years ago isn't as funny to somebody currently because it, of whatever reasons you know i just hated that the current man has a disclaimer but it. just publish the old stuff who cares <laughs> you know but um uh, where was I going with this thought? So, I mean, that it, that just makes it harder to do a, a, a humor magazine. But it is possible. I mean, he's not getting, but, you know, we'll probably talk about Freaky at some point, so I'll mention it now. It is possible to put humor out there where you're not t- being terribly topical necessarily, and you're not always, like, bad-mouthing the president, you know, and stuff like that, and just doing the same superhero movies going to the well over and over again but yeah um it takes some effort and takes you know it takes effort on both sides i mean it takes effort from the side of someone like andrew goldfarb to publish a freaky takes effort on the other side which i don't think he's really achieved yet of having people line up you know wanting the next issue you know um You know, it's a, somebody mentioned, you know, I forgot who on the quotes, uh, if it was Kyle or one of the other ones, was saying, you know, kids read manga and then they, they read graphic novels and they're voracious readers. Well, maybe Mad should do that. I mean, I don't have it with me, but uh, Marvel's been doing this thing where they're reprinting like the first 10 issues of Fantastic Four, Amazing Spider Man, X Men, and everything. The early 60s ones with Kirby and Ditko and uh, what we're talking about in. Uh, Si- graphic novel size, you know, is the same size oh, as yeah. Smile and any of the other ones that are really popular. And they're in the kids section. They're not in the the adult uh, comic book section. They're over there in the kids section. And it's like, that's what Mad needs to do. I mean, you know, if they're not going to even have a, a magazine on the stands anymore, they certainly should have a book, a bunch of books out there that are like graphic novels. Um, yeah, I think um, I disagree with that. Uh, in, in only one respect, I, like to me, it's it's almost like that idea of, you know, chasing the YA bubble. Like right <laughs> now, there is that graphic novels for kids, which, uh, you know, like Raina Talgemeier, there's only one Raina Talgemeier, and she's the fucking queen of, you know, uh, kids graphic novels. She, she's made a mint. 
But, but even a few years ago, they did like Planet Tad and junk like that. I don't know if yeah. it's sold and, 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 you know. Well, I think that it, I agree with what you're saying about Freaky, which is I think you have to just, I don't think you can, as a Mad Magazine, uh, I don't think it, they would be well served by chasing a fad. I think what they would be best served by is like the freaky model, yeah. which is let's just make stuff that's funny. <laughs> let's let's focus on that first um, and get away from you know. I mean, I don't even want to say political humor, uh, but topical, like ti tired political word, humor. Because that, that's what yeah. I'm saying is like if you are going to be topical, the only thing that they should do in Mad is. Uh, be topical with movies and TV parodies because that's yeah. that's been Mad's thing since the first issue, you know. And I'm not talking about the issue that came out two and a half years ago. I'm talking about 1952. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, granted, you might think that you know the first movie parody probably was Ping Pong in issue six, but I mean, they had genre parodies in the very first issue, and those genre parodies are similar to movies, you yeah. know. Or radio shows, at the very least. So, um, and yeah, so yeah. that's that's the backbone of Mad that's not even being done. Why the fold-in is? I mean, it's like you know, God bless Johnny Sampson for being the sole <laughs> usual gang of idiot regular right now. But I don't understand the point. I mean, it's like they, they you know, they basically kick Sergio out. I mean, I guess there's a few new marginals, but it's like. How dare anybody fire Sergio Aragones is beyond me. I mean, he should have been drawing till his dying day for Mad, like uh, Jaffe did. I think Jaffe only quit because he's a hundred. You know, yeah. we got twenty more years out of Aragones that you know he'll just have to do Gru or something else. I guess you know it's like yeah, you know that would be another thing. I'd bring Aragones back immediately. You know, it's like he would be a regular again, and I'd pay him anything he wanted, six figures. You got it. You know, yeah. That'll well, be 10 bucks is, an issue, but this is why we brought back yeah. Sergio. <laughs> well, so I'm about to say something, and I don't want it to be interpreted as a, a lack of respect for, like, those big names, right? Uh, like Sergio and Jaffe and everybody. Um, I think that MAD, one of the problems MAD had is that they relied too much on those big names, well, and they left, and there was nobody to replace them. Yeah. And they didn't do enough to build up a new name. They gave a lot of people work and a lot of yeah. people a lot of work. Um, but, you know, so they had things like Fundalini pages or the yeah. strip club, and they got all sorts of people in there. But then there was no breakout name from that. There was well, no... Yeah, the last um, one might be Tom Richmond. But, I mean, the main reason why is, like I said, you know, when I was doing my Mad book, uh, you know, Mad ceased to become the goal. You know, mm. it used to be the goal where you went. You went to MAD, and that's where you finished your career as a star for MAD. Yeah. You know, maybe you might do something on the side like Dick DiBartolo doing Match Game or something like that, but you stuck with MAD. You didn't leave it. Yeah. These guys, MAD is nowadays, I said the ones from the last 20 years, you know, it's a stepping stone, and now they'll have a successful children's book line or they'll have a successful Nickelodeon show or a successful Cartoon Network show. Which but is, is all that well like, and good, but they should stay with Mad because they're the ones that founded them. You know, I, this you is know. why I would say to push back though is, you know, I mean, me if there's no spot for you there, if all you can get are you know like a, a four panels on a page that is filled with other people's work, what's the motivation for staying there yeah. if they aren't even like promoting up and saying, okay, now you have a page. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you get to be your Don Martin, where we well, introduce you as Don Martin, so and that, such and such. That stuff's the problem of the editors. Uh, I think Bill Morrison was kind of trying to sort of shift it back, but he wasn't there long enough. So there wasn't enough traction of anybody. I yeah. know we brought in a few people, but it's like, you know, we don't know if Ian Boothby, we'll use him as an example. Hi, Ian. Mm -hmm. uh, he. He came in with Bill Morrison. Why? Because he worked with the Sims with him at Bongo Comics and the Simpsons for forever, and uh, you know. But he had never really been in Mad before. But now he's suddenly in Mad. But then seven issues later, you're gone because we just decided to close up shop. So, you know, anybody. But I think 
Morrison was kind of trying to build his new group of regulars and just didn't have enough time. Yeah. Um, I never say much flattering things about John Ficarra. So, you know, sorry, John, but uh, I've tried to interview him and he turned me down for the crack book and uh, he's turned me down every time I've wanted to. So I don't say flattering things. And he's also from the interviews I found not given very good interviews anyway. So, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, uh, prove me wrong. But <laughs> anyway, uh, I think he's a big, he was a big problem of what, made mad deteriorate you know and it's unfortunate and i don't know if there's much we can do i mean i could speculate all day what they could or should do but it you know Picaro was there in the editor seat um alone for like 18 years you know i mean you could you could say joe rayola and charlie Cadu Cadu and all those other guys were there with them but i mean the be all end all person was still Picaro, and i think he just got grotesquely lazy and just like just issuing tons of product and uh not really bringing in new talent to kind of you know i think sam viviano probably helped bring in like tom richmond more than john picara if it was up to picara he didn't have sam uh he probably wouldn't have gotten a tom richmond because richmond was over cracked and he probably would have left him over there yeah and uh secrets out folks in semi crack book, John Fakara started as a crack writer. So, <laughs> 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 which is why I wanted to interview him. It wasn't because he was there or mad. I wanted to ask him about his writing career at crack, but he didn't yeah. want to talk to me. So, huh? Anyway. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, I, I want to go to the go to the chat real quick. Um, Grew animation in the works. Watch the latest episode of GrewTube. Yeah. Um, do you are you familiar with GrewTube? I am not. He darkens uh, our doorway every once in a while. He'll show up in the chat. Um, it's it's a YouTube channel all about Gru, okay. and uh, yeah, he he's, he he has some pretty cool videos. Um, okay, I haven't seen the videos. I mean, I'm just actually uh, trying to seek out. I don't even know if it's out yet. The fourth issue of Gru meets Tarzan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Oh, there he is, Gru too. Nice to see I'll you, man. I have to check you out. <laughs> uh, Kyle. I really think the Gideon Kendall, Dalton Vaughn, Andrew Goldfarb, Kyle Bridget direction they were going could have worked. Yeah. I, I, I think it could have worked too. There were so yeah. many things about yeah. the new MAD uh, and you with umlauts. Uh, I think that there was so much that I absolutely loved about it. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, Doug Guilford, MAD DC at t one entity bearing all the responsibility. <laughs> Well, I don't blame forget AT&T solely, but you know that's just me. Yeah. And don't forget uh, <laughs> but Discovery I've also now. Picara, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, Discovery Channel has entered the chat. They would like uh, some attention. Um, my, I actually when that when I saw that that they're potentially selling DC or Warner Brothers in DC, and because of that, mad to um, uh, Discovery that. It fills me with hope because at least dis AT and T they don't create anything. Um, yeah. Discovery does. They're in the business of making things. I might not like the things they make, yeah. but they're in that business. So, um, yeah. The yeah. You know, well, Andrew Goldfarb, since his name was invoked, I think this would be a good time to talk about uh, Freaky Magazine. All right. I will yeah. talk about it because uh, let me give you a background of my relationship with Andrew Goldfarb. Yeah. I've known him since the fourth grade. So <laughs> he was your art teacher? No. <laughs> he was two years younger than me and still is. But uh, uh, I was in fourth grade. His older brother, Ed, uh, is a great musician and pianist and everything like that. And he was in my grade, uh, fourth grade. And I became friends with Ed first. And Ed mentioned to me that his that he or his family or his dad had every issue of mad and hearing that back in 1976 was like you know <laughs> you know i mean now i have every issue of mad so it's like ah oh, boring no but yeah. no seriously <laughs> no it was like oh my god i saw you know so anyway um 
graduated high school, Ed and Andrew, I, I knew Andrew just through Ed, but I didn't really know him really well. Um, but, you know, after high school and everything, we all parted ways and everything like that. Slowly over time through reunions and I went to Ed's house once, I believe, and Andrew was there and we started talking and I found I had more in common with Andrew than Ed. <laughs> and uh, not that Ed's... Uh, any slacker on the humor department. He actually has a pretty good sense of humor. It's just, I don't know if he would tackle a humor magazine like Andrew does, uh, yeah. which is fine. Um, so, you know, over the years, you know, Andrew and I, you know, and he's going to be a podcast guest of mine in December again. Um, nice. Yeah. You know, and he, he occasionally uh, composes songs that I use as my theme song. I change my theme song every so often. So I need a fourth season theme. And so he composed, well, something he already did. But anyway, so I knew him from his music. I knew him from his artwork. He had drawn uh, this for this publication called Pork, which was a giveaway that was distributed in California, Washington, and Oregon. And it was based in Oregon, which is now long gone. Um, but what happened to the, Oregon? Oregon's still here. Pork isn't here. So. Oh, the magazine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's still here. <laughs> anyway, but... Um, uh, uh, Andrew goes on this alter, alter ego, which is his band and also his own name is the Slow Poisoner. Yeah. And in Pork, other than, besides having little cartoony things like he does in his own Freaky, he had a feature that he took over and put in Freaky again called Ask the Slow Poisoner, where it's like an advice column where you can ask him a question. And I did ask him a question once. I can't remember what it was in one of the issues of Pork, and he responded. It's usually a pretty comical answer, you know, like you know, slow poisoner, how do I get bubble gum out of my hair or something like that? You know, and yeah. it's like, instead of saying the obvious use peanut butter or whatever, you know, it's like some off the wall answer, which was pretty funny. So he has done that and freaky. So when he got into mad a couple of years ago, I was alternately very happy, but also very jealous. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then Mad went away and I go, good. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> the funny thing is, on the aforementioned Christmas stocking, one of his uh, uh, three uh, published Mad articles gets reprinted every time in that thing since they don't change the thing. So Goldfarb oh, yeah. is still in Mad currently. <laughs> but anyway, um, he had seen a magazine, which I didn't bring it. I, I did a one shot at one point uh, called Frolic. And it was just to see if I could ever do a brand new comic book magazine all by myself, which I did. I only did one issue. And it was just a test. And in yeah. it, I, I wrote like pages that were mad rejects and I published them. And uh, when Morrison took over mad, I was considering, hmm, Picaro's not there anymore. Um, maybe I can submit the stuff that was rejected all those years with him. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, some of that stuff has now appeared in Freaky because uh, <laughs> Goldfarb said, why don't you send it to me? I can publish it, you know? <laughs> and so it, I don't know what you have up, but I can tell you which one was. Uh, yeah. Uh, the first issue I was in was issue number four. Oh, and yeah, I got it right here. The first article, I'm in two articles in there. The first one, Pandemic Memories, that, that was my only kind of, current take on current events and it just kind of how, how i operate hey can we flipping through it <laughs> <laughs> we are flipping through it <laughs> um so you know this one came about because uh he said do something on the pandemic and i thought you know it'd be fun to do like a pandemic thing kind of like in retrospect if you know instead of being 2020 to 21 like you know, it'd be like 20 years in the future looking back on it. And it was this old couple. And, you know, you can read through the story. I guess I could describe it. But it just kind of came to me. And uh, uh, Andrew said, this is brilliant. And I said, well, who's going to draw it? You know, because I didn't actually draw it. I, I just uh, wrote the dialogue. And he says, yeah. I'll draw it. And so he drew it. So this is the first thing we've ever collaborated on. And it actually worked out really well. Um and I was very surprised when it came out because I didn't see it until it saw print. He just said, you'll be surprised what I did. And I go, okay. And so yeah, this he is, I love his art style so much. Yeah. And I was very glad he did it because yeah, I love his art style too. It's kind of like Peter Bag, but it's really kind of his own thing. You know, it's like, you know, the, 
you know, I can't even compare it to Peter Bag. It's just the one that kind of came to mind. Yeah, and if you got if you don't have issue four of of Freaky, well, you got to get it first yeah. off. Hit him up on on Twitter or something. Get he'll, any of he'll the send issues. I mean, he has six issues yeah. now, and he he only puts out one or two a year. Or so, and yeah. I think he has this offer still going. Is he'll give you a free one if you've never gotten one before, just yeah. to try it out. You know, he's willing to do that. So you know, just hit him up. You know, yeah, but if you, it, yeah. what's great about this is like you know it, it starts off very like run of the mill. And it's just like all of the things that, you know, in real life, if you're reading this, are happening or have just happened. And then it just gets more like surreal and bizarre, all of these different memories of, that they they have of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, that's how I wrote it. And, you know, I, I, I grew up on a diet of Mad National Lampoon, Monty Python, everything like that, Saturday Night Live. You know, so I know how to write this type of stuff. It's just that, you know, when you're not given an outlet for it, you know, it just kind of stuck up here, you know, and it's like, it, you know, and I don't know where this comes from. You know, you just said, write something about the pandemic. And that's where this came from. It's like, I didn't, you know, plan to do a particular story. I did do the thing that Kurtzman has said, which uh, is advice for a writer. Try to think of an ending first and then write to that ending. And mm. I did come up with the ending first, and then the rest came easy. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Mm. And then you have uh, you have two pieces in this There's one, one, right? There's one other piece. It's on page 57, if you want to flip your... Flip, flip, yeah. flip. Hey, what's that mad thing in there? Okay, so this <laughs> one was a piece uh, that I actually contributed to Mad back in the Fukara days. It was probably about 10 years ago. And they rejected it. Um... They rejected everything I ever sent in, except for one thing, which I can talk about if you want me to. <laughs> yeah. But I never got credit for it. Um, <gasps> but let's talk about this one first. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so actually, this one I actually drew. And when I submitted it, I said, all right, it, you, know, I, you know, you can publish what I drew. Or if you want to get one of your better artists on it, I don't mind. You can redo it. And that's what Goldfarb did. He got uh, this artist, uh, Gideon Kendall, do it. And he did an excellent job. I mean, you know, my drawings aren't too bad, but I mean, he took it to a whole different level, you know, yeah. and it's like, you know, I go perfect, you know, because I can't draw this well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Were you familiar with his artwork before? No. And I didn't yeah. know he was going to pick him out. He's pretty um, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he's a mad contributor. Yeah. yeah. So it was perfect. So that was my first contribution. So, you know, for me, I was like all, excited because i go oh he actually published me yeah and i got paid <laughs> i got paid it's more important i got paid <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that well that's pretty cool I and mean, like i didn't realize that there was that close connection that you had with andrew yeah um that's pretty fascinating because yeah well he's from you grew up in california he grew up yeah. in california yeah um yeah, saratoga, saratoga which is near san jose is south bay now he okay. lives in San Francisco these days. So I used to live in San Francisco, but now I'm up in Oregon. So, yeah. Um, do you have a favorite piece so far that you've done for Freaky? Um, well, I, the one in issue four that you just showed, just because it was a mad reject, really impressed me. But you know, I think the best one is probably the one for issue five, since you're about to flip to it. Yeah. It's on 36. Yeah. Wait a second. I put this thing in the wrong spot. Yeah, so that's what I'm telling you. It's page 36. <laughs> Jeez Louise. <laughs> there it is. Um, this one came about. This one actually was like by a not a suggestion. It was just that uh Andrew and I were just talking about, you know, they used to have ye hangups in Cracked. Yeah. And uh, John Severin did a whole book with Don Edwing back in the day about medieval torture. He says, you know what doesn't appear in humor magazines anymore? <laughs> and they used to do this in Plop, too, is people in dungeons <laughs> hanging off the wall. <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, I it wasn't that day, I don't think. It was just like a week later. I was just thinking about it. And it's like, well, why isn't there any more? Oh, because they all got new jobs. And so yeah. this is what came out of that. And so I'm kind of proudest of this. That it was just, it, it wasn't even a suggestion of an article. It was just like, so, just bemoaning the fact 
that prisoners hanging on walls don't appear in humor magazines anymore. Why isn't that? And, and he got it immediately and drew this up. Yeah. My, and, uh, you know, and that's what's great. It's like, I don't even have to describe the thing. I, I said, all you have to do is just have the arms extended in every every picture. And yeah. he got it, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> The... Um... What's great about I remember I flip through these issues like whenever I get a new one I'll do it live and I'll just kind of go through and explore it and I remember seeing this one and remarking on it like it's instant like if you've read yeah you know Mad Magazine or Cracked and you know obviously you've said Beyond like you know that this is um, like a meme in humor magazines that right. has existed. Like you get it right away. Yeah, it's like it's, a guy sitting on an island with a palm tree, you know, waiting to be rescued by a ship. You've seen that cartoon a zillion times, you know. Yeah. What else can you do with it? Well, <laughs> I was able to do something with it, and that's why I was. I'm pretty proud of this one because of that reason. Yeah, it, this is. It, it came out well because of <laughs> uh, Andrew's artwork. Yeah, this is. It's fantastic. Um, oh, here, here we have a question. Uh, I'm curious what Mark and Patrick thought of Marvel's crazy one shot that came out last year. I didn't even notice it. I didn't know. Uh, yeah, there, there was um, a crazy one shot, and there was a trade paperback that unfortunately only reprinted a lot of the superhero crazy stuff, but at least there was a new crazy publication. Um, I thought it was okay. Um, I, dogs are barking in the background if you hear. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I thought it was okay. I was happiest that Bill Morrison was in it just because. It was like the first thing he did after being ousted from Mad. So I was like, "Oh, good for him! He got into crazy." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but uh, it, it it was good. But is it, it magazine was of, sized? It was comic book size, and they okay. did three different cover variations. They did a Deadpool cover, they did a Nebish cover, and they did an Obnoxio cover. Okay. I personally like the Nebish cover because I've always preferred the Nebish over Obnoxio the clown, but. Um, there is a few elements that were similar to old crazy, but again, the problem with Marvel humor in the last, what, since, since crazy went away, it's always been geared towards parodies of their superhero stuff. Yeah. Now they did that well when they did not brand deck. They did it okay when they did what the, but then they kept doing it in, uh, a new version of strange tales. And it's like, the well goes pretty thin on all that stuff. And when they did the crazy trade paperback, you know, it was welcome because, hey, they put some crazy material, but it was all their superhero based material. Yeah. It wasn't just a generic best of crazy. So there's no Casper the Dead Baby. There's no uh, Nixon Land. There's no, <laughs> what's the other stuff they did back then? You know, <laughs> no Nebish stories. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like it's all like vertical integration. Like, how can so, we keep you know our name on it? Yeah, and, um, and it was done just, for copyright reasons. Yeah, it was totally done to keep the copyright, uh, the trademark on Crazy Magazine. Otherwise, they would lose it, and then I would be publishing Crazy Magazine. So that's why they did it. So, <laughs> um, uh, did you have one more issue? Uh, did, uh, yeah, I, I do. One more issue, I do. Number six. Uh, that one is page forty-four. There we go. Yeah, I put I go. put the bookmark in the right spot this time. <laughs> yeah. um, Harvey Esquire, The Wizard of Id. Yeah, that was the one like in newspapers that would always have that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, on well, this, this one, I didn't know if uh, if um, uh, Andrew would take it, but he seemed to like it, you know, because I thought it might be too derivative of something that already appeared and cracked. But it just kind of came to me. It's like, uh, I think I came up with the bloody mary mix first for dracula and, and then you know the you know the other ones kind of you know kind of came out of that i think i had a couple more than he used but you know i think yeah. i had one for uh the wolf man i don't remember what it was maybe he's saving it for a future issue because this is the current issue so you know which is his right you know he can <laughs> have yeah. a recurring article so i think i did a wolfman one i think i did a creature of the black lagoon one. Ooh, the gill man um, i love yeah gill man yeah, so, yeah. Number one. And I think I did one for Pinhead or something. So, you know, it, this could have possibilities. I would love to come up with some sort of recurring feature. But, I mean, it's like, that's hard, you know, yeah. to come up with a spy versus spy or a fold-in or something like that that just hits it out of the park every issue, you know. Absolutely. 
you know. I love that. I'm a, I am a sucker for <laughs> anything Universal Monsters. Mm -hmm. So I loved this. And yeah. like Mark, Mike Stevens, hell of a job. Like this is like the artwork for this is just so cool. Mm -hmm. But this again, I, this, it reminds me of like, um, you know, uh, in Mad, you would, you can always go back to the Universal Monsters for humor yeah. stuff. And like Jack Davis, I remember he did a number of Universal Monster type uh, humor illustrations. I don't know who did the writing for those, but um, it's wonderful. Yeah. And I use Cottonelle. So this <laughs> really, that I could really relate to this. So, you know. So, you know, it's like, and, and believe me, even though Andrew and I are friends, he doesn't accept everything I turn in just because we're buddies. You know, he's turned oh, me down. Oh, it's nepotism. I knew <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> he's turned me down on a few things. In fact, he has done so more often recently. And I'm like, ah, oh, I got to come up with things. And because I do other things like write books and do podcasts and actually have a regular job and other things, yeah. it's like I don't sit there and write articles, you know, all day. You know, that's not what I do. But also articles just... The best articles just kind of come to me, you know, yeah. when I'm not even thinking about it. The hard part is if it comes to me at a time where it's not appropriate, like I'm at work and I'm supposed to be servicing a customer or something. And uh, hold on, I got an article I have to write down here. You know, it's like, you know, so but uh, usually it's like something that comes across pretty well. I could disclose ideas, but I don't want to say what they are because he may use them. So it's like, yeah, and I'd rather everyone be surprised. I don't want to disclose them before he's published them. But uh, hopefully, I, I think for, I will say this, I think issue seven, he liked a cover gag idea that I gave him. So that, I think I got the cover for issue seven if I, if he's, uh, if I'm on the right schedule. So <laughs> Nice. That's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Freaky is I'm I'm just so excited by Freaky and I I I kind of want to talk to him again because I hope the numbers are going up for yeah. him because it seems like it's growing in popularity I don't know but you know what do I know I'm just like sitting in my basement all day well he so. is distributing to different stores and I have seen it in a few stores up here so I mean that's a good thing that yeah. it has gotten into stores it, it, yeah it's, nowhere near like regular newsstand distribution unfortunately you know uh so subscribe give this man money uh <laughs> anyway, but um it's a start you know and as long as he was willing to do it you know and uh he, he keeps up the quality material i'm not saying my material is the best material in there there's a lot of funny stuff in there yeah. uh that i didn't write um as long as he keeps up the quality and the you know of the issues and everything and is able to continue distribution i think it'll be around for as long as he wants to do it yeah so. absolutely uh oh here we go with the gill go gil <laughs> now you want my my almost published in mad or maybe i was published in mad story yeah, we yeah, do. We Doug definitely Gilford. do. Want yeah, to. what did you do when credited for mad you know <laughs> he has Doug, listen he Doug has his website up Doug he's he's about to update it all right yeah. So, um, okay, so here's the story. I was watching Seinfeld one day, and uh, this is back in the 90s. And in fact, I can tell you when it was, it was about 19, it was about 1995. And I was, and I think they were already in reruns. So, I was just watching it one day, and they had uh, the uh, Newman, the postman, come to the door. And uh, Jerry opens the door and goes, Hello, Newman. And I said, oh, my God, you could have Alfred E. Newman there. That would be so funny. And then I thought, they won't publish that because they already did a Seinfeld parody. But, And then I said, oh, what the heck. I'll, I'll send it in anyway. You know. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I made the mistake of doing this or this is what I did. I faxed in my submission. Mm. And I never heard anything after that. And I go... Oh, well, well, you know, and I figured, eh, they won't use it. Uh, yeah. Because, like I said, they already did a Seinfeld parody, and they rarely go back to, they never do a second parody. But in this case, they actually used the cover. And uh, I was in the uh, store one day, and it was Mad 364. I don't know if you can punch that up. Otherwise, I'll, I have the Mad cover to cover book here, and I could show you. And, what was the issue? 364? Yeah. And uh, so... I 
go to, I, I never have been a subscriber to Mad until recently because you can't find it in the newsstand. I always bought it on the newsstand because I always like getting the best copy on the newsstand. That's just me. I'm weird that way. So uh, 364 comes out and I go, oh my God, they used my cover. I'm so excited. You know, and um, I pick it up and I open the page and it says cover artwork by uh, Mort Trekker. Cover artist, uh, not listed. <laughs> and I go, what? You know, I mean, cover writer. I mean, yeah, not listed. And I'm like, what? And I go, oh, well, they must have made a mistake. But at least I got my cover published. So I'm going to get a check for a decent amount of money because it's a cover thing. Da, da, da. And I wait about a month and there's nothing. And so I wrote him a letter and I said, yeah. hey. You know, uh, you know, I submitted this and I, I put in copies of what I drew. I drew a quickie sketch that looks just like this, except I, my Alfred was drawn uh, with a postman's outfit. I didn't have him just in a regular shirt because I figured yeah. nobody would get the joke if you just put Newman. So they changed it. And I got this nice letter back from Mad's lawyer saying basically... Oh, Mad comes up with jokes all the time. And, you know, they probably, it was a coincidence. They thought it was the same joke you did. Sorry about that. Uh, nah, 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 you know. And then, like, in the next issue, I don't know how many issues after that it was. It was, like, the next, like two or three issues later. They started saying, and they started putting it every issue forevermore. Mad does not accept faxed submissions. Now, why would they do that <laughs> <laughs> if they were trying to tell me something? Now, I could easily have sent it in the mail, but the reason I faxed it in is because there was no such warning back then. And also, I figured back then that was the quickest way to get it to them because I didn't have an email then. Time I, I is I got, money. You I, knew. I, you know, and I, I figured that this. would be the fastest way to get it to them. I, I did get an email address in 1995, but I remember I sent it by fax because, you know, it would have been faster. And even when you get mad cover to cover, which I'm holding up here, yeah. um, when you read on that page with those two issues, it says... Don't fax in no, it your submissions, say that. It says, Mark. says, artist, work trucker, writer, staff. You know, and it's like, those fuckers. <laughs> 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 so I always contend that I wrote it. I don't care. And Doug Guilford, no, you don't have to put it on your thing because I don't have justifiable proof other than my story. And I do have my letter saying, you know, from the lawyer, I still have it in my drawer over there. You do? So, yeah, I do. It's oh, nice. Do, you know, but, yeah. You know, I decided not to pursue it any further because my thought was if I really push my case, uh, then if I try to get published later, I might not be able to. Now, I've never yeah. been published later, and I'm wondering if they put me in some sort of special file. This guy is a troublemaker because he dare mm. question our expert intelligence and writing capabilities and uh, challenged our fax machine or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, so that's one why when Morrison came in as the editor, I said, oh, I can send in all the stuff that Fakara rejected or whatever because. He doesn't know that story, and yeah. maybe he'll actually get me published. But by the time I got around to it, Mad was already uh, getting rid of him, and you know because he's only there what six issues, seven issues, or something like that. Yeah. And they announced it by issue four or five, and it's like, damn it, you know. But I don't think I would have got in there fast enough. But I was friends with Bill Morrison, so he probably would have eventually put something in had he stayed. So. Well, and you know, if nothing else, you have a wonderful story a wonderful anecdote mm. with a lawyer from a letter from a lawyer. Yes. Uh, Mad's lawyer. It's on Mad stationery too. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's uh, in a way in maybe one way it's, it's better than having gotten credit is you get it. <laughs> so if, you get a letter from a lawyer. <laughs> if I indeed have uh, an uncredited Mad cover, then I was published before Andrew Goldfarb. So mm, yeah. <laughs> otherwise, well, you know, <laughs> I, well, and just to let you know, I did hit refresh on the Mad Cover Site page, and he has not updated it. So <laughs> I think it might be going I'll unchanged. I'll look later. Mark Arnold is full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, uh, Doug, well, Doug lives up here in Oregon too. He's up in Portland. I'm in uh, Springfield, in the middle of the state. I'm actually in Simpsons Land, but uh, <laughs> so we're both Oregonians here trying to uh, do mad shit. I don't know. <laughs> it's weird, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> yeah, there, no. There's a lot of you mad people out in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's somebody else. I still have this. The other Oregon madman. And it's, I have somebody's address. I don't know why I still have it. I forget who's, who's did everybody want to see it? Should I show it with everybody? Anyway. Um, hey, we've been, we've been talking for two hours. Oh, shit. <laughs> <We got laughs> I, from, yeah, but it's probably to take that website down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or like, uh, we, we are using this, uh, please, um, you know, don't cease and desist. I don't know. I don't know what a lawyer would say. <laughs> Bradford, that's the other one. That's who I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Bradford. 24 Smith. years ago. Okay, wait a minute. Does mine predate uh, Doug's? Wait, 24 years ago. Uh, 97. Say, Maybe wait. it's that's 24 well, years seven, ago, right there. Uh, 17. Uh, we're about tied. Here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 1995 was when I submitted that to, because it took about a year. That's the thing that was interesting about submitting oh. it. You know, it's like had I submitted it. Like, I wouldn't have thought that it was my submission and would have considered it, oh, it's just coincidence, had the mad issue come out, like, a week after I submitted it, because I knew the time wouldn't. But it came out over a year after I submitted it. Yeah. Well, it was a season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, Doug, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> oh, Doug, oh, I hope you do get to be... The madmag.com or whatever their website is. I hope you get to be their webmaster. I really do. That's why I put Susie's lab on there. Anyway. So. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, Doug probably submitted a new one. Probably <laughs> said, <yeah>, exactly. <laughs> but he didn't have my drawing with it. I drew. I put a little drawing. So. Yeah. Uh, well, Mark, we've spoken for, we've been going for like two hours now. Um, thank you so much for coming by. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful to talk to you about mad and cracked and all of that stuff. Um, and yeah, if you, if you want to come back again and talk more about this stuff, you are more than welcome. Cause this is I, I, quite a bit of fun talking about nice. this and <laughs> it is a, a long subject. I'm going to drop in the thing, um, in the chat, your website and, um, I'll do your, your YouTube link, uh, where you, you talk, tell them what you do again. I do a podcast called Fun Ideas Podcast. It originally started as an audio podcast, but now is a video podcast just like this. It's not totally live, but is live pre-recorded. And I write books about comic books, animation, uh, music, and TV and uh, movies. And uh, occasionally contribute to Freaky and apparently Mad Magazine. And... <laughs> <laughs> Do a lot of other things, but you know, it's like those are the main things. So yeah, check out my website, check out uh, my books on Amazon or Bear Manor Media, and uh, it was great being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. If you guys want to support this channel, hit that thumbs up button. Um, it helps the live stream. It helps my channel. Hit subscribe. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, let's. I'm gonna thank some people. Shane Buckley, <laughs> uh, Doug Guilford. Thank you for coming by. Harvey Esquire. The, now this is. I should tell you. I think that he is um, uh, the son of Harry North Esquire. That's why they have the same last name. Um, who else? Dem, uh, Demir. Uh, Kyle. Thank you guys. That's all. I'm. That's as far as I'm scrolling. Thank you guys so much for watching. And um, I don't have any of this stuff there. Yeah, toodaloo. <laughs>